In this lesson, we'll look at electrical power. The first aim is to describe the meaning of current, voltage, and power, then compare alternating current and direct current, AC and DC, and then explain two methods of calculating power. Now, I can't think of a scientific principle we take more for granted than electricity, so much so that many students find the idea of learning about electricity quite dull. And I have to ask, when did this happen, or why did this happen? Because the story of electricity is amazing. I'm almost amazed they haven't made a film about it, although the film The Prestige came close. I think the problem with electricity is the use of it has just become too easy. And when things come too easy, we take them for granted. All we have to do is flick a switch and amazing things happen, although we don't even see them as amazing anymore. The fact that a light instantaneously switches on. The fact that a TV produces a myriad of colours and, and sounds. Electricity has the ability to make things move and spin as if by magic. But the truth is, we don't appreciate it when we use it. Maybe, or perhaps because it requires too much thought. But it's thinking and imagination that led us to the discovery of electricity. It started, as you might imagine, by observing lightning. Earlier generations of our species used to look at lightning and wonder what it was and whether we could control such power. And this set us upon a journey of discovery, which has resulted in the modern world we interact with every day. But what is electricity? Luckily, P1 doesn't require a lot of knowledge on the topic, so I'm not going to go into full detail here, only what you really need to know for the exams. To understand electricity, we must first understand the matter responsible for producing an electric current. And that matter belongs to atoms, and specifically, it's the electrons in atoms. Now, electrons carry a negative charge. As you can see, I've put a little dash there for negative. And in metals, unlike non-metals, electrons are free to move through the material. They're not restricted in orbits around the nucleus. They can move through it. When charged electrons flow through a wire, an electric current is produced. So an electric current is simply the flow of charge, or how quickly that flow of charge is occurring. So this would be a small current, and as you can see, it's moving slowly. Whereas this would be a big current, and it's moving faster. Now I'm going to introduce you to a few essential circuit components. Now the first one says a battery, and we call it a battery in day-to-day -day speak, but technically that terminology is wrong. What we really mean to call it is a cell, and we represent a cell like this. A cell supplies the circuit with energy. A cell has two ends, or terminals. One terminal we call negative, and the other one is positive. Now for many years we believed that current flowed from a positive terminal to the negative terminal. But a long time after we thought this, we realized that electrons actually have a negative charge. And when negatively charged particles are near each other, they repel each other. So scientifically speaking, it makes much more sense that electrons flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, where they're being repelled. Now, because electrons are continually moving around this way, they are building up at this end and being removed from this end continually. That's why this side is negative and this terminal is positive. However, old habits die hard and when we draw circuit diagrams, we still draw them incorrectly as if the electrons are flowing from positive to negative. We call this conventional current. Even though it's incorrect, we still use it. Presumably because too many systems were set up with this in mind, so we just haven't changed it. A battery is actually a collective noun for cells, so you can have a battery of cells, many cells linked together. Sometimes a battery is drawn with dotted lines in between the cells, but it's not essential. Sometimes we just cram the cells next to each other. So that's the difference between a battery and a cell. So I said a current is a flow of charge around the circuit. Certain electrical devices can measure this flow of charge, or the rate of flow of charge, how quickly this flow is occurring. We call such devices ammeters. And in a circuit, we denote them with an A and a circle around it. Most students do not have a problem remembering this because of the A for ammeter. Then, of course, we can put appliances into our circuit. The appliances are the interesting bits that do things. For example, light bulbs produce light and heat. And we represent light bulbs using this circuit symbol, a circle with an X in it. A bit like the X-Men symbol. Though bulbs can also be drawn like this. Another circuit symbol you need to know as we go around our circuit are resistors. Resistors are useful for slowing down current and basically giving you a bit of control over the circuit. So very important in electrical devices where you don't want too much current flowing at the circuit doing potential damage. But also they're very good for use in circuit experiments to work out electrical relationships. 
A resistor is basically a thin coiled piece of wire that basically forces electrons into a narrow stream so they move slower, there's more friction. And resistors look like this. Very simple to remember, just a rectangle. Now there's one more device you need to know of, and that has to be connected in parallel to the circuit. You see all these circuit components are in series, they're in one loop, but here we have a second loop. This means that this component is connected in parallel to the resistor. Parallel literally because of parallel lines. So this device is parallel to this. This is called a voltmeter, and quite simply it measures voltage, and for that reason it's given a symbol like this. Again, easy to remember, just the letter V for voltmeter. A for ammeter measures current, V for voltmeter, it measures voltage. Another word for voltage is potential difference. What it's really measuring is the amount of energy transferred by our charge carriers when it passes a component. A voltmeter basically dips its prongs into two parts of a circuit. One attachment occurs before the component, the other attachment after the circuit component. It quite simply measures the energy at two points and works out the difference. So the energy the charge carriers have at this point and the energy the charge carriers have at this point after having gone through the component. It then gives you the difference in the readings and thereby indicates how much energy this component has used or transferred. For this reason, voltage is also known as potential difference. So just to recap, remember the cell supplies energy to the circuit, that's over here. The ammeter measures the current, the rate of flow of charge. Remember, electrons carry charge and they flow through the wires, and an ammeter just measures the rate of flow. It gives you a reading in amps, A. The bulb is a machine or an appliance that transfers electrical energy to its surroundings as heat and light. Different electrical appliances will transfer different forms of energy. A resistor is a thin coil of wire that slows current down, and a voltmeter measures potential difference, the difference in energy between two points in the circuit. In an exam, they really do commonly refer to voltage as potential difference, so please make sure you're aware they mean exactly the same thing, voltage and potential difference. So here are a few key facts to help you summarize what we've learned. Firstly, electrons carry a negative charge. Then current is how much charge passes a point in one second. So an ammeter literally counts how much charge passes in one second and gives you a reading in amps. Voltage is how much energy is transferred to and from the charge carriers. In other words, the electrons. So electrons will acquire energy from the cell, so they'll acquire a voltage here. And as they travel through circuit components, they transfer energy out. Voltage is also known as potential difference. And remember, conventional current flows from positive to negative terminal. That's how we draw it, but it's not how it actually is. And actual current flows from negative to positive terminal. That's not how we draw it, but that is how it actually goes. So that's how we describe the meaning of current and voltage, as well as looking at simple circuit components. Now, the second thing we look at is AC and DC. You may have heard this before. There's a famous rock band named after this. AC simply means alternating current, and DC means direct current. Basically, depending on the source of electrical energy, current can either flow two ways around the circuit, in other words, goes one way, then the other way, one way, then the other way. This is called alternating current. Whereas other electrical sources produce a direct current, where the electrons just move one way around the circuit continually. So a battery is the most common source of direct current that we know of. It literally just pushes electrons around the circuit in one direction. You'll notice that when you switch on a torch, for example, the light comes on instantly. That tells you the electrons don't have to travel, we don't have to wait for them to travel to the bulb. It's we can think of it like a queue of electrons, and when you push one, it pushes all of the others in the queue, so the light comes on immediately, as those electrons at this part of the queue are forced through the bulb to transfer their energy. If you turn the battery around the other way, the appliance will still work, it just means the electrons now flow the other way around the wire. So if this way we called a positive current, this way would be a negative one, the reverse of that. In this case, positive and negative only indicate direction. A solar cell is another example of something that produces a direct current. More and more houses are being fitted with solar panels as they become more popular, but also commonly used to power calculators. But a generator is basically how we produce electricity that will then travel to our homes through our plug socket well, they are sources of alternating current. In other words, a generator will push the electrons one way around the circuit, then the other way around the circuit very rapidly. 
We can easily find out if an electrical power source is generating an alternating current or direct current by hooking up the circuit to a cathode ray oscilloscope or CRO. This produces a wave of electricity for us to interpret. Now on these graphs produced, or trace graphs as we call them, you have time on the horizontal axis and voltage on the vertical axis. You see you have a halfway point above which is positive and below which is negative. So an alternating current will produce a trace like this. It will go from positive to negative, then the voltage will be generated in the positive, and then negative again, and so on. Whereas a direct current, you don't get the switch from positive to negative, it just appears in one direction, depending which direction, for example, the battery's connected up. It can either be just positive around the circuit, or the electrons can move the other way around the circuit, and a producer voltage that only acts in one direction around the circuit, so either in the negative or positive. This comes up quite a bit in exams, you have to recognize trace graph. Very easy, really. How they might try and fool you is on a direct current trace, they might draw a line a bit like this, and you might think, oh, it's going up and down, so it's alternating current. No, it's not, it's still direct current. Unless it actually goes into both positive and negative regions like this one, it remains a direct current, so look out for that. So the key points here, an alternating current sends electrons one way around the circuit, then the other way from positive to negative, then negative to positive, and direct current sends electrons only in one direction. As a result, their trace graphs, which you can see on cathode ray oscilloscopes, well, alternating current goes from positive to negative, positive to negative, and direct current will just stay in either the positive or the negative. And that's how we compare AC and DC. So now let's examine the idea of electrical power. Your first awareness of when you look at power is when you're changing a light bulb or looking at light bulb power ratings. Power is measured in watts, and here we have a 40 watt bulb. Basically, this bulb will transfer the electrical energy flowing through the wires to the surroundings as heat and light. The quicker it does this, the more powerful it is, and the brighter it glows. So you can see a 60 watt bulb basically draws more electrical current every second and therefore transfers more electricity or more electrical energy into heat and light, so it glows brighter. But also as a result, it draws more energy from the cell, so the cell will drain faster. So all electrical appliances convert energy. Our bulb, as I said, converts electrical energy into light and heat. Power is really a measure of how much energy they convert in one second. So you can see in this simple diagram, a 40 watt bulb transfers less energy in a second, a 60 watt bulb transfers more, and an 80 watt bulb transfers the most here. So the textbook definition of power is the amount of energy transferred by an appliance in one second. For that reason, power is measured in joules per second. Joules is a unit of energy, and seconds a unit of time. So how much energy is transferred over time? To simplify things, we call one joule per second one watt. So the unit of electrical power is a watt. So you remember current is the rate of flow of charge, so how much charge is flowing past a point every second, and voltage is the amount of energy the charge carriers carry, the electrons carry. So let's say in one second this specific bulb draws this much current. So we can see those charge carriers have passed this point but now they don't have their energy because it's been transferred by the bulb. A 60 watt bulb will draw more current in the same amount of time, in one second, so more charge carriers with their energy will pass this point in one second. This is why it glows brighter. So this is probably the most important part of the lesson. There are two ways to calculate power, and it's easy marks if you understand. Remember the formula at the front of the exam paper. Firstly, we can just work out power by multiplying current and voltage. So in this circuit experiment, I just want to work out the power rating of this bulb. Now the current in a loop circuit will be the same all the way throughout the circuit, so our ammeter tells us that the current in this circuit is 0.4 amps. The current reading will always be a lot lower than the voltage reading, generally speaking. Now to measure the voltage or the energy transferred by this bulb, we need a voltmeter connected in parallel. So the voltmeter measures the energy that the charge carriers have at this point, and the energy after going through the component. A handy tip to remember is all the energy the charge carriers have must be used before they return to the battery. So if this is the only component they have to deal with, then all the energy will be transferred by this bulb. That's why it says zero here. And the voltmeter just gives you a reading, which is the difference in energy between these two points. So the reading will say three volts. So let's assume in this example that these electrons represent 0.4 amps of current. And let's say that each electron or charge carrier is carrying three volts of energy as is supplied by the cell in the circuit. So literally as they pass through, you are multiplying 
3 volts by 0.4 amps and that will give you a power rating of 1.2 watts. So it's really simple, just look for the current reading in the question, the volt reading in the question or potential differences it may be called and multiply them together. That's an easy two or three marks. Don't forget your units as well, remember power is measured in watts. The second method is simply energy transferred by an appliance measured in joules over time. That logically makes sense because power is joules per second, joules over time, how much energy is transferred over time. Both these equations are literally saying the same thing, energy over time. Here it's more literal, energy over time, but here voltage is the measure of energy and current is the measure of time because it's flow of charge over one second of time. So here's a typical question, if a bulb transfers 1200 joules of energy in three seconds, what is the power of the bulb? Do what you normally do, underline the key components, so energy is joules, so 1200 joules, and time is in seconds, so three seconds. So once again, we just plug our figures into this formula, so 1200 joules divided by three seconds will give you a power rating of 400 watts. So the key points here are you must be able to recognize the definition of power. Maybe it's a multiple choice question. It's the amount of energy transferred over time. Energy and time, that's the key thing. Therefore, it's measured in joules per second or watts. And just remember there are two ways of calculating power. Current times voltage or energy transferred divided by time. But that is how you explain two methods of calculating power.